Okay, well, thank you. Thank you guys for coming out. I appreciate it. And making the trip. How, how far is that trip? Uh, about an hour. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, well, we'll make it worthwhile for everyone. Uh, we have a lot of great things to taste and sample and pair today. So I know you've heard this before, but my name is Kim Larkin, and I am from Cheshire, Connecticut, and I'm a commercially licensed chocolatier and an art teacher. I've been teaching art and uh, chocolate programs for around 20 years. And I travel around to uh, libraries in Massachusetts and Connecticut and now New York, uh, teaching different programming, creative programming and food pairing programs. So today we're going to put a little twist on our normal chocolate program and we're gonna highlight a little bit about love and friendship and pair it with some great uh, chocolate and some foods that are considered aphrodisiacs. So the first uh, chocolate we have is just a plain chocolate heart, which is a guitar chocolate and it's 68% cacao. So that's mid-range chocolate. Um, but we're gonna pair that with brie. That usually pairs very nicely with a brie. Um, it sounds different, but the brie really can uh, sort of accent the sweetness in the cacao. And because it's a soft ripened cheese and a cow's milk cheese, it's very neutral in flavor. So we're gonna try that. And I took these cheeses out about an hour before. Uh, I'm sure if you've done cheese samplings at home, you wanna make sure that the cheese comes to full room temp so you can really taste the flavor notes. So that'll be our first pairing. This is a double creme uh, brie. So that has a good amount of fat in it. That's why it's so viscous on your tongue. And uh, they actually have triple fat brie's as well. Um, and this ripens from the outside in. So the, the uh, rind, that bloomy rind that is on there, uh, I'm sure you know is edible, but it adds to that nice flavor between the softness of the cheese and the rind. So we'll try that. Uh, the next chocolate we have is a bark. I always bring some type of a bark. This one has uh, a variety of things in it. It is a 72% guitard. So that's a little bit higher up. We're more in the healthful range now. The 68 is a little bit shy of the healthful range, but it's still delicious, so we don't worry about it. 72% uh, includes um, pumpkin seed, raw pumpkin seed. Yes? Quick question. Yes. Only the last few years have I heard about bark. I don't really know what defines bark. Yeah, I'm, I'll tell you. Oh, okay. Good question, good yeah. question. So bark is a chocolate. In this case, this is a tempered product since I have the machinery for tempering, the commercial machinery. But basically, even if you made it at home, it would be a melted cacao, some type of a, a percentage of chocolate, uh, thinly poured on a piece of uh, a slab of marble or on a baking sheet um, on top of parchment. So this is easily easy to make. And then you add your different textures. So this has in it pumpkin seed, raw pumpkin seed, and raw organic uh, coconut. And so those two, um, being raw, they have uh, you know their natural oil, so it adds a little bit of viscosity to and heft to the bark. And crunch, of course, my favorite. And then it has a cranberry uh, infused, an infused cranberry, excuse me, with like a blueberry uh, juice. So that's nice, that gives it the berry flavor. And then there's always some type of salt in it. So sometimes I'll use Himalayan pink salt, and in this case, it is a, a Celtic salt, a sea salt, and I like that flavor, it, it's sharp. So, um, and the difference is with tempering versus doing it at home. So this is, tempering is a shelf-stable product. So I made this in the workshop. So let's say I make this and I cover it and I keep it out of sunlight and I keep it at normal room temp. In like eight months, I unwrap that, it will taste the same, it'll be fresh believe it or not. Uh, whereas if you make it at home and you might let it sit around for a little bit, uh, and the next few days you might notice that your chocolate has a bit of a cast to it, you know, it like looks a little gray. Remember when the kids put the Halloween candy under the bed for like eight months and then you take <laughs> it out? I remember those days. And, uh, and then it, it's gray looking. So that's out of temper, out of whack, the temperature, okay? But, and this also, tempering also has a snap to it. So if you bite into a truffle, you get that little um, like um, encased uh, ganache inside, you get that little snap, which is nice. So we're gonna, so that is gonna add, first we start with something sem semi-neutral here, and then we're gonna move up to our bark. Uh, and then from there, we're going to pair it with um, 
a fig spread. So you may or may not have had this before, uh, but this pairs beautifully with dark chocolate. Uh, this is a fig spread, and, and a fig is considered an aphrodisiac. So because of the texture and um, the flavor and uh, the heft of it. Uh, so the fig spread has, uh, it's interesting, it has sugar in it, but also it has citric acid. So it has a little bit of a, a balance of flavors, which is really nice. So this it usually is delicious with brie as well. Fig and brie go very well together, brie and any fruit really. Uh, but that is a beautiful pairing. So that'll pair really nicely because that's a little more of a dense, sweeter flavor to go with the bark. Um, and then at the end we have um, a triple aged cheddar. So I always bring some type of a, an Irish triple aged cheddar. So the, the longer a cheddar or a cheese um, is aged for, you know, the, the stronger and richer the flavor. So when you have something that's aged two plus years, um, the moisture gets wicked out of the cheese and the fat is intensified. So you, and it, it becomes crumbly in nature, but it, you also get those uh, little crystals. Have you ever had those little t uh, crystals when you bite into an aged cheese? So that's, uh, t those are tyrosine crystals and they're fine to eat, but it shows that a cheese has been really well aged. So that is a nice finish. And this is, this is an excellent cheddar. Uh, and then we're gonna start with a, um, a little uh, beverage that can be adapted um, from a mocktail to a cocktail if you so choose. Uh, if you're looking for something to have that's a little bit different. So this is, um, uh, we call it love potion number nine, of course, right? But uh, what else would we call it, right, today? So, but this is a basis of um, a cider and a sparkling cider and grape juice and uh, red sparkling grape, white sparkling grape, and then pomegranate juice, uh, Palm Wonderful, mm -hmm. that you can get the natural pomegranate juice. So pomegranate is also an aphrodisiac. You're welcome. <laughs> We're trying to work it all in here today. There's a lot of aphrodisiacs, I don't know. So uh, that is really nice. And then I cut it with a little bit of um, uh, some type of a citrus seltzer. So when you try it, you may find either that you like it uh, hopefully, or if you find that maybe it's a little bit sweet. So if you find that it's sweet, if you want to replicate this at home, you just add more seltzer. Or if you want to turn it from a mocktail into a cocktail, which I have done and I really like it, it uh, you can add a, uh, a Prosecco or a dry white wine or a red wine. So you can really have fun with it, make like a sangria with it. It's, it's really good. So we'll start you out with this. So this will add a little bit of the berry flavor on your palate and then we'll move right into the first pairing, all right? And in between I talk and then you listen and I feed you. You know how it goes, right? <laughs> okay. It has Palm Wonderful in it. It has sparkling grape, red grape, sparkling white grape, some cider, and then, um, uh, seltzer. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. It's a little bit Very cleansing, delicious. but some people yeah. like my sister tried it and she likes things that are drier. So we added, we added alcohol for her <laughs> and then she was happy. Yeah. See that? Imagine All right. That. Yeah. Imagine. All right. Let's see. I wanted to make sure I give you a napkin. Let's get you a napkin. So this is, uh, I'm sure you've had brie before. So this is imported from France and, um, like I say, the double cream is delicious and the triple creme is awesome. Any type of, uh, and that's basically like you can, that's spreadable if you've had those cheeses before. Mm -hmm. Delicious. Okay, so my crackers were breaking on me, so we'll, here you go. Thank you. Okay, so if you're uh, int into pairing these together and trying it, Take a bite of the chocolate first and let it sort of melt on the back of your palate and then follow up with your, your brie. I normally don't put the brie on the cracker, but it was very, um, very warm. So I wanted to make sure you were able to handle it. Okay, so this is the sweeter chocolate. So, you know, it, it's delicious, but you're not gonna taste as much cacao on your tongue as you would if you were biting into, uh, let's say, like a 90% cacao, right? If you've had that before, that's mostly cacao or cocoa on your tongue, so you can really taste that. But I, I really enjoy the brie with the chocolate. Usually, a lot of people like it paired with milk chocolate as well. But milk chocolate is 33%. 
So that's a lot of sugar. Even though people love it, it's heavily laden with sugar. It's only one third of cocoa uh, product. So it's better to go with darker chocolate. And I have more cider if you'd like to follow it up. You know, just raise your hand and I get that to you. Yeah, so I'll tell you about that now then, okay. So um, dark chocolate in nature, and you guys have heard this before, but uh, basically the studies have said that 70% and up is the most healthful. But in reality, you want to really, the higher the better, because that means the less sugar you have. So if you have the 85% chocolate, then uh, 85 on the package represents the cocoa um, amount in there, and then the remainder, which would be 15%, is the sugar. So the, the less sugar, the better. And so for the darker chocolate, um, there are a lot of studies out there, but they say uh, you can have two, two one ounce squares a day. That's easy to do. <laughs> That's easy to do, right? Two one ounce squares. And uh, so that is supposed to help. They've done studies um, with your cognitive reasoning skills, your, uh, your uh, functioning in your brain because a dark chocolate um, sort of dilates your blood vessels and, and helps with thinking and uh, clear blood flow is the basic idea behind that. It's good for um, inflammatory issues. So there's a lot of natural fat in the cacao bean. So it's very good for natural, um, natural um, healing of, or you know, helpful in healing inflammatory issues. Uh, also, it lowers your LDL, which is your bad cholesterol which is great. It's very high in magnesium. So a lot of us, especially around my age, as you get older women, your, your minerals and things sort of, out of can go out of whack. And magnesium is one of uh, the minerals that actually we know sort of regulates over 300 functions in the body. So, and one of them is mood, the serotonin levels. So it actually can help with regulation of your, uh, your mood with the darker chocolate. And someone always, uh, I always have someone say, but does that mean the minute you bite into it, that's why you're happy? It doesn't work that fast. <laughs> it's not instantaneous, but it happens over time. So then there's all different types of uh, chemicals in it as well in the darker chocolate, like uh, anandamide. And that is actually considered like the bliss hormone. So it all, there are a lot of different um, antioxidants in there, but definitely if you can handle darker chocolate, it's better for you. Also, if you've tried the Lint um, product, Lint, I feel, is a really excellent product for higher percentages of chocolate. So 90% in Lint is really pretty smooth uh, compared to some others that could really give you like that chalky taste and you, you won't even enjoy it. So Lint 90%. So you should try it. Yeah, you should try it. And if you don't, no, you, I mean, some people are like, you know, it is going to be a little bit bitter, but uh, the 90% really in lint, it's really smooth for a 90% product. Also, if you don't like that bitter flavor, and I make this experiment every night, as I always say, I always have a glass of Malbec wine. And the Malbec, the residual sugars in the wine, will counteract the bitterness in the chocolate. So you'll have a nice blending of flavors. It really is good. So these are the some of the reported foods that are aphrodisiac. So oysters, who loves oysters? Anybody? I do, raw or? Raw. Raw, I'm, I can't do raw. Raw? Yeah, oh wow, okay. So the raw oysters are the highest in, um, in the different uh, minerals that are supposed to really pack a punch. So the spring oysters are the ones in the, in the beds that have the strongest amount of iron in them and also the number one mineral, zinc. Okay, zinc is supposed to be the aphrodisiac and that's why oysters are consumed. And Casanova ate 50 oysters before every date. 50! <laughs> and followed by champagne and chocolate. So that's like the trifecta, right? You can't go wrong with that. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, cooked, I mean, you're still getting the brininess and there's still zinc in there, but the fresh is. Especially, I've, I've read many articles that the spring oysters are the finest for that. And then pomegranate, we just had um, the, po oh, there's pomegranate juice in that, the uh, natural pomegranate juice. So the pomegranate is the fruit of Aphrodite. 
And so she was supposedly the first to plant the first tree on the Isle of Cyprus. And of course, anything that has this many seeds in it is considered a uh, food that is uh, sort of uh, associated with fertility. Okay, so pomegranates actually, when people were getting married in the Roman times, they would actually roll a pomegranate through the door first, like bowling for a spare, to hope that you would conceive on the wedding night. <laughs> There's no break, right? Right on the wedding night. So that's the pomegranate. And then we go on to chocolate, which I told you about. Basically, it is uh, the mood elevator. So that's why it's considered an aphrodisiac. And of course, all these things as well, the mouthfeel and, and how they taste with, we were talking about the fig, um, the graininess of the fig and the heft of the flavor of the fig. So anything that is, uh, you know, um, creates texture on the palate. So champagne and red wine. Um, the yeastiness of uh, the champagne and the red wine, they both mimic male and female pheromones. So when you smell that, it, you're, it brings to mind the smell of like musk, right? Uh, and then apricots, uh, the aborigines in Australia actually use the apricot kernel and brew it for teas um, on wedding nights for people. And then they go the step further and they blend uh, the apricots or beat the apricots to um, like a pulp. And then they spread it on the arms of the brides as perfume. That's sticky. <laughs> Someone said, and who, who washes the bedding after you have apricots? The, the women, that's who. <laughs> and then honey. So honey comes from uh, way back in the Middle Ages. Um, actually, it goes further than that uh, to even the Celtic traditions. And Hippocrates uh, believed that honey actually restored vigor in people. So he actually prescribed that um, medicinally. But uh, in medieval times, they would take the cups of mead, the fermented mead, and they would add honey to it. And then people that were getting married would uh, drink that at their wedding banquets. And it was supposed to um, help again with fertility. Uh, figs we talked about. And then on top of uh, uh, the taste of figs, and the reason, um, another reason is, is they have the seeds, the many seeds. Uh, so fertility um, sort of, you know, is uh, associated with the figs. And then also the author, um, D.H. Lawrence, that wrote Lady Chatterley's Lover, he refers to the fig constantly in the book and refers to the shape of it as uh, like a woman's body, very voluptuous in shape. Um, so, and then it is also um, related to Adam and Eve with the fig leaf. Uh, so it's, uh, it's fertility and yet it's modesty. So I don't know, that's a mixed message, right? I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. Okay, so then there's another crazy food that is associated a as being an aphrodisiac and that is asparagus. Isn't that strange? So asparagus um, in uh, Greek times, they would um, encourage the bridegrooms to eat three meals of asparagus. <laughs> I don't know, but that, that comes up in all the lore that that is considered an aphrodisiac. Uh, so, and I wanted to tell you a little bit, um, I always just highlight this quickly, um, just about where our chocolate comes from. So this is just the picture of the cacao pods that grow in the rainforest. And these are in different stages of ripening. And then after all the processing, these are our roasted cacao beans. Um, and the nibs, which I don't have here today only because it's a little too astringent. Sometimes I bring them to my programs, but cacao nibs are the roasted uh, and broken down beans. You've had them before, right? So um, I wanted to just show you, this is what the pod looks like without the pulp. And then these are the beans. And then once these are fermented, and roasted and crushed, those are the nibs. So the nibs and the cacao powder are those two things that are most closely associated with almost like raw cacao, right? That's as close as you can get. And they are, again, because chocolate is an aphrodisiac, they would be uh, a, an aphrodisiac as well, the nibs being uh, closely related, you know, very closely to the natural form of cacao. And then also, um, uh, Montezuma used to drink the nibs steeped in hot water. 
uh, and only the elders of the tribe, the Aztecs, would drink that. And, um, and that was supposed to help because he had a harem. So he supposedly drank up to 50 cups of that a day to give him a natural energy because it does have caffeine. So uh, <laughs> who knows, right? So <laughs> all right. Before I begin with the next thing, I wanted to ask, does anybody want more uh, drink? Would you like some? OK. So we're going to go on to the bark. So this could be like a cleansing drink if you'd like. Anybody else? Any yep. OK. You're welcome. Okay. So now that we've had our first pairing, we'll start with our bark. So our bark um, has just a tiny bit more cacao in it, uh, and we are going to pair it with the fig. Okay. So take a bite of the bark, and you'll have that heft on there. Oh, did you hear what was in the bark? Just to make sure you don't have any allergies, right? Okay. So it has pumpkin seed. Uh, natural coconut, um, Celtic sea salt, and a, an infused cranberry. Okay. All right, so we'll try this first. So take a bite of this. Okay, so save just a little of that, and you'll pair it with the fig. So if you've not had fig before, you can have uh, the raw fig, which is delicious. Raw fig and honey many times is served. Uh, on Valentine's Day. Um, sometimes I'll serve that with just the raw fig with drizzle of like raw honey. That's delicious too. It's a fig jam and sometimes there's a product also called, I couldn't find it uh, this time, but sometimes I'll, I'll uh, serve it. It's called fig cocoa. Have you heard of that? Yeah. So it's basically this, but it has cocoa powder in it. It's delicious. So you can actually ch change it up and add cocoa powder yourself. Uh, so it gives an even uh, more complex flavor, which is really nice. All right. So while you're enjoying that, and I hope you like the bark. I love the bark. I think it's great. I love any type of bark. I love anything with texture. It's great. Uh, so um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the famous uh, couples throughout history for Valentine's Day. So of course, you know, when we think of Valentine's Day, we always think of love, but it's friendship too, right? And these couples, except Casanova, <laughs> were all friends. And Aphrodite, who we celebrate today, right? She was uh, the Greek goddess of love. And her son, Eros, supposedly um, pierced her uh, chest with one of his arrows. And uh, he is Cupid in uh, Rome, right? Venus and Cupid and um, uh, Aphrodite and Eros in Greece. So uh, she immediately uh, turned her gaze to Adonis, uh, a mortal uh, hunter. And that's where the story comes from, Aphrodite and Adonis. And so she warned him uh, that he had to be careful around the beast because he's a very good looking man. So she said, even though your visage is pleasing to me, the beast, you know, bears don't care. <laughs> but did he listen? No, of course not. And so he continued to hunt, and uh, a boar overtook him and pierced him. Uh, and so uh, she actually, um, you know, I, being Aphrodite, didn't mourn for too long. She had to continue on, right, and spreading the love, spreading the love. She's known to have many trysts. She had trysts with um, Aries, Mars, Poseidon. You get the drift, right? <laughs> you know, spreading the love. So uh, that was Aphrodite. Now, her name comes from Born of Foam. And the legend goes that she did not take kindly to any uh, disrespect. And there was a, a man that worked in the stables. His name was Glaucus. And he was disrespectful to Aphrodite. That was a mistake. And so he went into his chariot race. And she fed his horses magic water. I don't know what that is, magic water, and the horses turned on him during the chariot race and trampled him, and then, just to add insult to injury, they ate him. <laughs> so, so you don't dis disrespect Aphrodite, right? So that was Aphrodite. Then comes Antony and Cleopatra. You know that uh, story. That doesn't end well either. That's a, sort of a sad story. I know. We've, we're going to get upbeat sooner or later. So Antony and Cleopatra. So. The interesting thing about Cleopatra was 
she was a very, very intelligent woman. She actually spoke nine languages, and she was uh, an accomplished mathematician. And she actually uh, spent time uh, in the convent, but that didn't work out. And back in those days, you actually, in order to keep the bloodline, she actually had to marry her brother. So she married her brother, and then she went on to be the mistress of Julius Caesar. And then after he passed, she fell in love with the Roman uh, general, Mark Antony. And they actually did marry, uh, but of course, Egypt and Rome were both against it. They didn't want them to combine factions. And uh, uh, Oct uh, General Octavian actually uh, ambushed them, took them over, took their troops over. And uh, Mark Antony, it was sort of like the, the first Romeo and Juliet, right? Mark Antony heard that Cleopatra passed and he fell on his sword and she um, encouraged the snake to bite her. So that, yeah, that's not very happy, is it? All right, moving forward, moving forward. All right, this is a great one, John Alden and Priscilla Mullins. So Priscilla Mullins, I speak about her in my, my harvest program because she was a tough cookie. She came over as a young girl on the Mayflower of one of 28, and after the first winter, she was one of like six that survived. And she actually uh, met John Alden in uh, the small uh, Plymouth colony. Uh, but of course, um, Miles Standish caught her eye. And you've heard that uh, poem, The Courts Courtship of Miles Standish. Uh, so that was written by Longfellow, sort of telling the story of, of the sort of the the love story of the three in a way. Um, and Longfellow is actually a, a distant relative of Priscilla Mullins. And so basically, uh, he, Miles Standish was older than Priscilla Mullins. She was very young, she was only 18. And he, um, he fell in love with her, but he sent John Alden to do the Cyrano de Bergerac, you know, speak my truth for me. That never works out, right? That never works out. So, so Priscilla fell in love with John, and they did get the blessing of Miles. And then this is the most interesting thing. So here, this young girl makes it over on the Mayflower. Can you imagine that? She makes, over, makes it over on the voyage, makes it through the first winter. And then she marries John, and she goes on to have 11 children in the 1700s. Imagine, 11 children. And then they move to Duxbury, the two, and they sort of settle the town because there are 13 people. They probably were the town at the time. <laughs> and they both lived to be in their 90s. Imagine that. So that's good hardy stock, right? Isn't that amazing? So we're getting up there. That's better. That was happier, right? That was a happier story. All right. And then Casanova and everyone else, right? <laughs> So he was a character. Uh, he actually was born in Ve Venice to, in the 1700s to actor parents. And, he, you know, he reminds me of this spoiled only child. Uh, he was, uh, they first didn't know what to do with him, so they put him in the seminary. And being Casanova, that definitely didn't take. He was kicked out of the seminary. And then he actually worked for a cardinal, and he was dismissed from that. So he went on to a variety of jobs. Uh, but basically, uh, you know, he loved women, and he wrote a 12-volume vol autobiography about himself, obviously. 12 volumes, I know. <laughs> <He's laughing. laughs> all, all about himself and his exploits, and it, was, it just shook everyone because it was very detailed and graphic at the time. Uh, and he told all about how he ate the oysters and the chocolates and the champagne. And then he, uh, you know, he stayed too long at one too many places, and he just traveled around. He was he fleed from creditors. He became a magician, a violinist. You know, he was on the lam basically, and uh, and he died in his seventies. But uh, he, of course, he made his mark for you know uh, writing um, about the exploits. So I thought that was pretty darn funny. Um, and then all friendships take all different forms, right? So Aristotle. Um, was one, where is it? I love this. He was one, Aristotle of all people, he said there are three different types of friendship and love. And one was, um, the, or the best one is the friendship of the good. Uh, and that basically, the others are of utility and common interest. But the uh, friendship of the good is like what you could even have with a spouse or deep friendships. 
and that is where you appreciate one another, right? Uh, and he said, Wish, uh, wishing to be friends is quick work, but friendship is a slow ripening fruit. So I thought that was interesting. Even back then, uh, he knew that. So these are some of, um, since we're in a library, some of the things that we've read, uh, you know, growing up about different friendships. And I used to do um, children's programs for 15 years in my library. And I just remember these are the books that were my go-to, and I love them. So, of course, a true friendship would be Winnie the Pooh and Piglet. And uh, Pooh said, there, there, Piglet, I know you don't feel much like yourself today, but, you know, I will take care of you with tea and hot honey. So I remember reading those books to my children. And then, of course, another classic friendship where they were from totally different worlds were Charlotte and Wilbur, right? From Charlotte's Web, right? And he said, Wilbur said, Charlotte, why do you do all this for me? I've never done anything to you. But she said, it was because you are my true friend. And we know those are few and far between, right? A few friends, a few good friends in life, right? And I love this one. It said, Wilbur didn't want any food. He just wanted love. <laughs> and then the last one, which I think is great, is uh, Shel Silverstein. You probably read his books. Um, he was uh, a poet of humorous poems for children and adults, really. And I actually had someone come up to me the other night and say, do you know that uh, Shel Silverstein co-wrote the, the Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue? I did not know that. Isn't that something? So he said, how many slams in an old screen door? It depends on how you shut it. How many slices in the bread? It depends on how you slice it. How much good is in your day? It depends on how good you live it. And how much is, love is inside of your friends? It depends on how much you give them. I love that. So that's just a little bit um, about friendship and love. OK, you listen. Ready to eat? <laughs> See? Okay. So now we've had the dark chocolate and the fig. So we're going to uh, finish up with our cheddar, which looks, oh, it looks very ripe here. It looks great. So this is uh, two, it's almost a three year old age cheddar. So, and it's a Killarney cheddar. cheddar so we'll see what you think of that. And I have plenty. So we'll have Thank more. You. Oh, why am I doing that? I, I don't know, know why I'm doing that. <laughs> Thank you. That's why I put the toothpicks in there, right? Hello. What do you think of that cheddar? Oh. Very good. Isn't it good? There's also another one that, believe it or not, uh, it's unbelievable. I sort of uh, just happened upon it, and I think it's excellent. It's called Old Crock, and it is sometimes sold at Big Y. And I, I just tried it one day for myself, but it is an aged cheddar. It's grass-fed and organic from Australia. It is tremendous. It has so much complexity, and they have extra sharp. So you should try it if you get a chance. You would really like that. Um, so if we had um, another chocolate, what you would do is, for a sampling at home, you would pair this heavy cheddar with a 90%. And I do do that. So 90%, and it sounds weird, but to try the dark chocolate, like we're saying, and the, you know, the uh, cheddar has that creamy flavor. And it, and it also, when, when cheddar ages, you get the caramel notes developing in it, right? So it actually has more like complex sugars in there. So it actually pairs really, it's a great pairing. And of course, remember drinking them all back after. Makes it even better. <laughs> or Prosecco if you like something a little bit sweeter. No, that's only 72%. So that's pretty, that's pretty mild yet. Oh, by the way, um, with everyone eating uh, healthful chocolate now, <clears throat> excuse me, there is actually a 100% cacao bar in the, in the candy aisle that's lint. Imagine that. Not in the baking aisle, in the, in the candy aisle. So you can actually buy, I can't do that, but 100%. Imagine no sugar, no sugar at all. So, okay. All right, I wanted to tell you about this, whoopsie daisy, about floriography. So this um, was sort of an interesting thing that happened around the Victorian times and ties into Valentine's Day. Um, and now, you know, the language of flowers we know today when you put a bouquet together, you call the florist and they put a nice bouquet together. But way back when in Victorian times, 
people were sort of encouraged to be very subtle and things were, you know, not PC to speak about, like your love and how you were attracted to someone. So in, in those times, they actually came out, out with floral diaries. So you would look up uh, the flower that you wanted to communicate your message with. And then you would put the, you know, have the uh, florist put the bouquet together to symbolize what you were trying to say to that person. Uh, so th this is pretty interesting. I'll just read this to you. And then it was also how you held the bouquet once the woman received the bouquet. So this is pretty self-explanatory. If you smell it and then you do this, that means go away. <laughs> A downward bouquet is rejection. If you held it to your uh, chest near your heart, you were accepting someone. So it was actually like code on the street, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. So women would walk around with something like this called a tussy mussy. You probably saw this when you, you've seen weddings and things like that. But a tussy mussy, tussy it actually refers to the knot of flowers and then mussy refers to the, the uh, moist moss that they used to put inside to keep the flowers alive. So sometimes um, they would add herbs to it. And the reason for that was as women, especially women of culture would walk down the streets, the, the streets where the open sewers were, right back in the 1600s, you would keep your tussy mussy close to your face because you didn't really want to breathe in the bacteria in the street, so you were breathing in the essential oils of the flowers and the cleansing herbs too. And of course, those oils and herbs actually would coat your nasal passages and actually protect you, hopefully, from breathing in other things. But that would be the code. So you would have different flowers um, that would be sent to you. So these are some of the um, these are some of the uh, flowers and what they mean. So. Red roses are for lovers, as we know, right? Yellow roses are for friends. Peonies are for, are for prosperity. And yellow carnations are to make amends. And then orchids and tulips for luxury and grace. Daisies for true loyalty. But all three will put a smile upon her face. White roses for innocence, so plain. And then wild roses for pleasure and or pain, which I thought was great. Lilies for pure love. Poppies whisper, I'm free, and hyacinths declare that you are very charming to me. But whatever your bouquet is mysteriously trying to convey, just make it a big one this Valentine's <laughs> Day, right? Play it safe, right? Okay, and that was in the Victorian era. Okay, and then also in Valentine's Day, you probably know the story of St. Valentine back in 270 A.D., uh, he was actually performing marriages and he was a bishop and uh, there was a, um, an emperor Claudius who did not want the men to be married because he felt that men that were married were made weak soldiers. <laughs> so he wanted no marriages being performed but uh, Valentine of course was, didn't believe in that and he also wanted to abolish Christianity. So uh, Valentine was performing marriages in secret, and of course they arrested him. He went to jail, and uh, he actually s supposedly fell in love with the jailer's daughter, Asterius, who was blind, and the uh, lore goes that they fell in love and she mysteriously regained her sight, but he actually wrote her uh, the last love letter, which was signed, Your Valentine. That's where we get that from. And he died on uh, Valentine's Day, and that's, well, he didn't die on Valentine's Day. It became Valentine's Day on the 14th of February. Okay, so I wanted to read you these. These are real country love songs, okay, and I hope you, I hope you like them. I thought, I really like them. So this one was written by Dan Hicks and his Hot Licks in 1969. How can I miss you if you won't go away? <laughs> That's my favorite. <laughs> this was written by Rusty Ford, which I'm sure is a stage name, in 2012. If the phone don't ring, baby, you know it's me. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> this one was written in 1965 by Billy Walker. I'm so miserable without you, it's just like having you here. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, this was written by an Australian band. Uh, it, the title is, If You Leave Me, Can I Come Too? 
And then Merle Haggard wrote this one in 1972. It's not love, but it's not bad. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, lastly, I want to tell you, not to forget to tell you about these things, and then I'm going to ask you a quick quiz, okay? There's always a quiz. You should be awake with all the chocolate. You look worried. Don't worry. It's fun. It's fun. It's not math class. Don't worry. All right. So uh, the final traditions for Valentine's Day, the ring, right? Of course, that symbolizes eternity throughout all different types of culture. But supposedly the reason we wear it on our left hand, our left ring finger, is the Egyptians actually believed that the nerve that goes directly to the heart is connected to the left finger. Uh, in the 1700s, Welshmen would actually carve wooden spoons for their beloved, and they'd put different symbols like uh, anchors and love, uh, or hearts for love, anchors for trust. And then the women, uh, or they probably weren't women, very young girls, right? They would hang the spoons in their windows to like show that they were taken or they had a suitor. And in the Middle Ages, men wore um, paper hearts on their sleeves at dances of the women that they were interested in. So wearing your heart on your sleeve, that's where that came from. Uh, and then American colonists, these are some vintage um, Valentines here. And some of the colonists would actually uh, trace their hands and put the heart inside the hand. They'd actually make these also these love knots, similar to like the Celtic knots. Uh, and then they'd add like a rhyming verse that moved in and out of the knots. but it didn't matter where you began the verse, um, it would be continuous. So um, that was sort of from the 17th and 18th centuries. And then uh, the wealthy also used to hire uh, people to write um, uh, poetry, uh, hire <laughs> Valentine's writers to write poetry. And you, can actually buy, you could actually buy a Valentine writer, which was actually a book to uh, you know, uh, fill your, um, your, your plain blank Valentine with as well. And then finally, in the Civil War, um, they would actually engrave, um, the soldiers would actually engrave dimes because they were very soft with their initials and pierce them and make them into uh, uh, jewelry for the 10 cents. I don't know. I'm not sure if I want that. But anyway, I guess it's the thought that counts, right? <laughs> and, uh, and then, of course, you heard about, you know, wearing the, your love's uh, hair in the locket back in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. And there are also something called uh, cuff bracelets, and men would actually wear the hair of the uh, women sometimes in a bracelet, which is that's sort of different, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know if I like that. Also known as handcuffs. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. The chocolate kiss, right? Um, Milton Hershey, he wanted to perfect the perfect kiss. And um, he came up with that in 1907. And the idea was, or where the idea for the name came supposedly was, when they dropped the chocolate onto the belt um, to form it, it made that sound coming up off the belt. And also in Italy, uh, the bocce kiss, right? You've heard of those before? The Italian made by uh, per Pergina, the silver kisses. Um, but guess who uh, owned that company? The Butonis. Can you believe it? The pasta family. So they had a pasta uh, empire, and the father actually came up with the chocolate company, and they created their own kiss, which I thought was pretty cool. Now, if you've seen it, there's something out called ruby chocolate. So ruby chocolate is a, a new type of chocolate that was introduced by uh, Barry Calibo in Belgium. Belgium. And he actually uh, came up with the idea of using these un unfermented beans that actually, um, when they were processed, have like this pink cast to them. They actually add citric acid to the chocolate um, to create and maintain that color. So if you've heard or seen, has anybody tried ruby chocolate? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's similar. Have you tried it? No. Um, so it's really pretty. You know, it's a pretty color. But in actuality, it's... A, less, um, more, excuse me, more in sort of like the flavor uh, profile of like a milk chocolate. Sweet. It's very sweet. But they say it has that citrus flavor because it has a citric acid for balance. So something different, something a little different that they came up with. All right. All right. Are you ready for some questions? Yes? No? Well, they're coming anyway. Ready? Here you go. All right. 
Valentine's Day. So what item was once called Aphrodite's nectar? Was it wine, chocolate, or honey? What do you think? Honey, that's right, it is, it's honey. Uh, what holiday do we spend the most money on? Christmas, Easter, or Valentine's Day? Valentine's Day. Um, in 2019, it was 19 billion. But that's a combo of uh, chocolate and flowers and cards too, cards. Yeah, because not everybody celebrates Christmas, but everybody celebrates Valentine's Day. <laughs> Uh, or you better celebrate it, right? <laughs> I mean, come on. So uh, the Aztecs believed in the power of cacao, and the Spanish mon monks adapted that flavor. Remember the, uh, the nibs steeped in the hot water? So that was pretty bitter. Um, so they omitted this ingredient um, when they first got it, the Spanish monks. Llama butter, chili pepper, or tallow? What do you think? Being the Spanish, right, chili. That's right, chili pepper, they took that out. And they added like a wildflower and raw honey just to sweeten it. Um, Cupid is the Roman god of love and Venus was his mother. So um, his name means either amorous, beauty, or desire. What do you think? Desire. Yes, right, desire, that's right. Um, what was the first year that uh, Hallmark debuted their first Valentine, 1916, 1880, or 1900? Right, 1916, that's right. Um, and there was, um, who was it? Esther, I wrote this down because I couldn't remember it. Uh, Esther Howland of Worcester, Mass, published the first Valentine in America in 1849. How about that? Um, how many calories do you think you burn kissing for one minute? I don't know if it's worth it, I have to say. I'm not sure. 50 calories, 75 calories, or 26 calories? 26. 50. You have to, like, increase it. At least, at least two minutes, right, to make it worthwhile. What liquid did Cupid spill on roses, causing them to magically grow? Red wine, nectar, or lavender oil? What do you think? That's right, nectar, very good, that's very good, okay. And um, let me see, let me ask you one more. Um, <laughs> what fictional character said, life is like a box of chocolates? Oh. <laughs> Valentine's chocolates, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so do you have any questions for me before I wrap it up? I will definitely get you your chocolate, sir. Okay, so I have, um, I have some cards. If you have any questions that, you know, or how to make your bark, just ask me. I'll give you one. You can email me any questions you may have. And uh, feel free to come up and graze because we have a lot of food here, okay? Um, and I want to thank you for coming, and happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. Thank you.